Aloha and welcome to our lecture today. We are going to talk about a very important topic and that is swallowing. Uh, it's very important as nurses for us to be aware of our patients difficulties when swallowing and we refer to this as a dysphagia when they have difficulty. So the first thing we're going to do is look at some of the anatomy uh, um, of the uh, soft uh, palate and the pharynx and the epiglottis and trachea and the esophagus. So let's take a look uh, over here at our slide. And um, the important thing I want you to notice is that there is a separation between the trachea and the esophagus, okay? And so we have this epiglottis. And so the epiglottis is pointed upward uh, during breathing uh, with its underside functioning as part of the pharynx. So if we look at this, this image here, we can see our epiglottis pointing upward. And this is during breathing. So what happens during breathing? Our epiglottis is pointed upward. During swallowing, elevation of our hyoid bone actually draws the larynx upward and as a result the epiglottis will fold down to a more horizontal position and what this does is it protects the trachea from food going down so we talk about food going down the wrong pipe right if we are talking and laughing and eating and 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 you know being kind of like not really focused Sometimes food will get stuck in our trachea, and what happens? We cough, okay? And so um, that is because food ended up getting into a place where it is not supposed to go, all right? However, most of the time, and in a healthy individual, um, when we swallow a bolus of food, that epiglottis ends up pointing downwards, protecting the trachea so that the food can be routed into the esophagus and down into the stomach where it belongs. Because if food gets into our trachea and into our lungs, we call that aspiration, and that can cause pneumonia. So if we take a look uh, at these images here, we can see uh, the, the yellow bolus of food. Uh, that, that is chewed up, and it, uh, as the individual begins to swallow, uh, we can see that epiglottis uh, pointing upward. As the patient continues to swallow in, in uh, the, the B picture, we can see it kind of pushing uh, on that epiglottis as it starts to point downward. In C, we can actually see that uh, epiglottis pointing downward and that bolus of food being uh, kind of directed into the esophagus. Uh, and then in D, again, we see uh, the continuation of that bolus of food. Uh, once it passes that point, uh, we can then see that the epiglottis will go back into its original position so that we can breathe again, okay? And so this all happens quite quickly uh, during our eating process. So we never really get short of breath while we're eating, um, but certainly uh, it's a very important thing to consider when you're a nurse because sometimes our patients have problems and usually these problems occur uh, with our nerves. So um, the glossopharyngeal nerve sends fibers to our upper epiglottis that contribute to our gag reflex, and our superior laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve send fibers to the lower epiglottis that contribute to the cough reflex. So when we have nerve damage, like in the case of a stroke or with some of our other neuromuscular diseases, Sometimes we lose the ability to have that cough reflex or that gag reflex um, and, and also damage to our nerves can um, interfere with the natural um, way of, of our swallowing reflex itself, okay? And so when these things uh, occur, uh, we refer to this as dysphagia, 
It says dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, all right? And there can be non-degenerative reasons that we have dysphagia, like in the case of a stroke, uh, we have nerve damage, uh, if, if we have brain injury, uh, or a congenital, um, which would be a, a congenital uh, uh, anomaly is something that a, a, we are born with, like cerebral palsy. Um, and then we can, we can have medications that actually cause um, problems with our swallowing. And so these are all non-degenerative causes of dysphagia. And then we have degenerative causes, which would be a more progressive course. Like in the case of dementia um, and Alzheimer's disease, we can end up having swallowing difficulties. And this is due to the cognitive difficulties. Uh, we can also have movement disorders like Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease that can um, cause uh, dysphagia. Um, actually, the medications that we even give for, for Parkinson's disease um, can cause difficulties with swallowing. So um, signs of dysphagia, things that we want to watch uh, for in our patient would be a longer time uh, for completing their meals, avoiding food altogether, um, weight loss, uh, coughing or eating when drinking, um, and then also like a voice change, a particularly gurgly vocal quality during mealtime. Um, drooling is another sign of dysphagia. And patients may complain of food kind of sticking in their throat, right? So they're just going to explain it to you um, in, in kind of a way that you know, makes sense to them. Like the food is getting stuck in the back of my throat or, you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't swallow. Um, it feels scratchy or, or it feels wet or, you know, there's just different ways that they're going to describe it to you. Um, but as the nurse, we need to be able to identify that our patient may be having problems swallowing because what we don't want to happen is for them to aspirate meaning that because they're not swallowing properly, they end up getting food in their trachea, food in their lungs that then causes pneumonia. So during feeding, we always want to make sure, uh, especially in our patients who have problems with dysphagia, that they are sitting at a full 90 degree angle. And we also refer to this as a full Fowler's position. This is a full 90 degree angle with their head flexed forward at midline, um, but remaining fully upright through the entire dinner. This means raising the head of the bed all the way up. So when we see this positioning here, we might say, oh, well, you know, that looks pretty good. No, it is not. It is not a full 90 degree angle, okay? Um, and so we really don't want to position our patients who have dysphagia like this. Okay, that is a no-no. We want to position them like this, fully upright. Okay, this person is just tilted back a little too far. They're almost at 90 degrees, but not fully. Okay, so during feeding with patients that have dysphagia, we want to avoid hovering with the next spoonful of food because it might cause them to hurry. And if they're rushing and they're feeling nervous because you're trying to kind of shovel the food in their mouth, they're going to be at a higher risk for choking, right? So don't rush. You want to allow at least five to 10 seconds between each bite or sip. And it's okay to let them have sips of fluids in between each bite. We want to watch for pouching. So in the unconscious, um, Collecting of food might happen on one side, particularly after a stroke due to this hemiplegia, which would be weakness maybe on one side of the face. And um, uh, another thing that can help is to have the head tilted towards the stronger side. Um, in case of hemiplegia, this could help avoid the pouching that, that occurs. So we want to make sure that the mouth is empty after each swallow. Uh, we want to keep our patients upright for at least 15 minutes and preferably an hour after eating. Um, 
And this is because after they're done eating and their food is, um, their stomach is full of food, if we lay them flat, there's a chance for that food um, to, to regurgitate back up into their esophagus and again, put them at a risk for aspiration. So we always wanna keep our patients upright after eating, especially if they have swallowing difficulties. We also wanna make sure that a suction apparatus is at our bedside and has been checked and is in working condition. Because once your patient starts choking, you go to get the suction machine and you find out, A, it's not at the bedside, or B, it's there, but then you go to turn it on and it doesn't work. It's not gonna help you. So, when you're in the clinical setting, you have to make sure that you have functioning equipment. We see the suction machine in this image over here. It looks very outdated. And I'm not saying that outdated looking things can't be in working order. But what I am saying is that it's much better to have a suction machine like we see over here on the other side of the slide, um, which looks much newer and much more functional. But again, always plug things in. Make sure that they're working. Uh, this other little piece up here uh, is a Yang Gower, and that is how it is pronounced. You'll hear people call it a Yanker, a Yank Gower, a Yanger, um, but it is a Yang Gower, and it is a, a, a little apparatus that we connect on the end of our suction tubing that then connects to our suction machine that we can use to suction out something that is stuck uh, in, the, in the mouth or uh, in the back of the throat. So if we have a, a resident or a patient who we think might be having some swallowing difficulties, we can have a, sw a bedside swallow evaluation done um, either by a speech pathologist or sometimes an occupational therapist where they'll use um, some kind of a, a tool, like maybe this tool that we see here. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, let's see, what do we call this one? The Gus screen. And so this one is a preliminary investigation for an indirect swallowing test. So the thing that we're gonna look at is the patient awake, awake alert, and oriented. Um, are they able to cough and clear their throat? Um, are they able to swallow uh, their saliva successfully? Um, or do we see drooling? Um, and are there voice changes? Um, is there a hoarse, hoarse sound to their voice? Is there gurgling? Uh, is there some kind of weakness? Um, and their, their swallow. So they will get a score and then we will decide whether we need to, to send them for further testing um, to, to evaluate their swallowing. So if a patient begins choking, we need to remember what the universal sign for choking is. Um, and we always want to say the, to the individual, are you choking? Yes, I'm choking, or they won't be able to talk at all because there's a bolus of food stuck and they cannot breathe, right? So remember our first aid for choking. If we have a patient who is showing the signs of choking, we have to act fast. We want to say, are you choking? We want to jump in there and try to use the Heimlich maneuver to dislodge whatever is stuck um, in the back of their throat. Um, if the patient becomes unconscious, uh, we always want to call for help, and then we want to go right into our ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. Um, but again, it's very important to make sure that you call for help, get the AED, call 911, and attend to our patient or our resident, okay? And so we wanna remember uh, that our patients with dysphagia uh, are at risk for aspiration, and we wanna make sure that we do everything that we can to keep them safe uh, from, from aspirating and ending up with aspiration pneumonia. 
you know, in our um, uh, Kapuna, ages uh, 65 and older, uh, we have lots of different reasons why they can be at risk for being malnourished. Uh, we have to remember that there are physiologic, pathologic, sociologic, and psychologic reasons. An example of a physiologic reason would be decreased sense of taste. Food doesn't taste as good. Maybe I'm not going to eat so much anymore. Pathologic would be an example of teeth, bad dentition, the need for false teeth, maybe false teeth that aren't fitting well. Uh, problems with dysphagia could be considered a pathologic problem that can contribute to malnutrition. There's sociologic uh, uh, contributing factors. Maybe they can no longer prepare the food or shop for their food. Maybe it's a financial problem. They can't afford food. Um, and then psychologic. We always have to remember that dinner time, meal time is a time for socialization. Uh, and a lot of people really enjoy sharing that with another individual. Some of our Elderly patients might be lonely. They may have recently lost a loved one and be experiencing grief. And these will be reasons that can impact their appetite. So I want to keep that in mind. Uh, I also wanted to talk to you about the National Dysphagia Diet. This is a national standard for dietary treatment of dysphagia. The NDD sets parameters for acceptable preparation of food in each dysphagia level. So here we can see levels one, two, three, and four. And what we do here is um, we, we can set our consistencies and uh, that way all staff knows how level one needs to be prepared, two, three, and so on. So for example, all items in level one must be smooth and pureed and cohesive and in a pudding-like pureed state before we can feed them to the patient. Um, there uh, is, here's kind of a rundown of what the National Dysphagia Diet looks like. Level one, basically pureed. Level two, minced foods. Level three, chopped foods. Level four, no hard items. There's also liquid consistencies when we talk about the dysphagia uh, diet, um, and they are thin, which means that you can drink any liquid with no thickener that needs to be added. There's nectar-like consistency, which is the consistency of syrup. There's honey-like, which is the consistency of honey, and we know that honey is a little bit thicker than syrup. And then there's spoon-thick. And spoon thickened liquids means that after you add thicket to the liquid, you've added enough thicket so that you could stand the spoon in the center of the cup and it would stay standing up. That is called spoon thickened liquid. Here is our thicket, which many of us are familiar with um, using. We add this to our resident or our patients fluids in order to get the correct consistency for safer swallowing of liquids. Okay, um, We're going to spend some more time uh, later on talking about therapeutic diets, um, but here's a list of some of the therapeutic diets that we have available. And um, I just want to encourage you to make sure that when you are preparing to deliver the trays to your residents' rooms, that you're very careful and making sure you're giving the correct tray to the correct patient. Um, because our diets in these settings are considered therapeutic and there are very specific reasons why we want to make sure they're getting the correct tray. Okay, so that's all for um, that section today. Uh, we will talk more about therapeutic diets next time.